Okay, I think we can, it's 6.01, we can get started. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, good evening and welcome to Right to Housing, a conversation organized by the AIA Los Angeles 2 by 8 committee to discuss pressing issues of housing in times of COVID-19. My name is Carlo Caccavale, I'm the executive director for AIA Los Angeles. And uh, as mentioned, this conversation tonight wants to dig into a crisis that has been going on for quite some time. And uh, clearly these past few months, uh, due to a global pandemic that has triggered a global economic collapse. It is at the full forefront of our conversation. We have a great panel tonight to discuss this hot topic, but before I proceed, uh, we proceed with introductions. I would like to say that this conversation stems from this year's annual 2 by 8 exhibit and scholarship program entitled Domum, which is Latin for house, which opened last week and uh, that you can experience at 2 by 8org www.2by8.org. Please check it out. I want to give a shout out to the 2 by 8 committee led by Tatiana Sarkisian and uh, Kirill Volchinsky. They and uh, um, a very committed committee, no pun intended, did a truly awesome job at creating an engaging virtual experience and uh, were able actually to raise $30,000 that were given out in scholarships just last week. Now, just a couple of housekeepings. Please keep yourself muted, but feel free to use the chat to interact, post your questions for the final Q&A and just like, you know, uh, say hi to each other. Uh, this event is being recorded and streaming live on our AILA YouTube channel and the two by Instagram account. Finally, if you lose your connection, just simply log back in. Back in. So now um, uh, in order to get this ceremony started, uh, I would like to introduce two by eight committee uh, Co-Vice Chair, Chuck Nguyen. Chuck. Hi, thank you, Carlo. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Chuck Nguyen, Co-Vice Chair of the Sierra's 2 by Committee. And I'd like to say that the 2 by Committee continues its mission to recognize um, exceptional students and the designers of tomorrow. But we're also very proud to bring you uh, educational programs like this one tonight. Um, this year has been very tumultuous for everyone and it's brought many new challenges and ex exacerbated many existing problems and some of which we will be discussing tonight. The panel will be an organic conversation between our guests uh, with general topics of the, on the effects of COVID-19 on housing. Our moderator, Luciana Varkoja, will help guide the conversation in three parts. Firstly, we'll be looking at the past um, sanitary crises, then what the reactions of, uh, to COVID could mean to the housing typology. And lastly, uh, the relevance of the pandemic on housing inclusivity. Then in the last 30 minutes, uh, we'll have an open Q&A session for everyone to jump in. So feel free to write your questions in the chat in, at any time and we'll pick them up, we can pick them up at the end as well. Uh, just a quick note that our panelist Dana Cuff will only be able to join us until seven uh, before she has to jump off. Um, so let me introduce you to our panelists tonight. Um, starting with Eileen Winderman, who is an architect, urban designer, community advocate, and educator. She is a fellow of the AIA, inducted in 2013 for her work on affordable housing, urban design, and historic preservation. Thank you, Eileen. Then we have Angela Brooks, who is a leader in the field of environmental and sustainable design and construction. She's pioneered the holistic ways of delivering affordable housing, sustainable architecture, and advances in social equity. Angie is responsible for firm development in the area of housing and policy at Brooks Scarpa. Thanks. And then Barry Milowski, who is a founding partner of M2A, Milowski and Michael Architects. Uh, his projects have received local, state, and national recognition for their excellence in design. Barry has been appointed by the mayor to serve on the Cultural Heritage Commission, the mayor's design Advi advisory panel, and the council district 13 design advisory, advisory committee. Uh, next, we have Dana Cuff, who is a professor, author, and practitioner in architecture. Her work focuses on affordable housing, modernism, uh, suburban studies, and the po politics of space, and the spatial implications of the new computer technologies. She founded City Lab in 2006 and has since concentrated her efforts around issues of spatial justice in the emerging metropolis. Three recent, recent awards describe uh, the arc of her career. Uh, the Architectural Record 2019 Women in Architecture Activists of the Year, 
the Architectural Research Center's Consortium 2019 Researcher of the Year, and most recently the AIA LA 2020 Educator of the Year. Uh, our last panelist is Ian Dickinson, um, who has been an active member of the academic arts and design communities. He's taught design studios at USC, Washington University in St. Louis, and has served as design critic for a number of additional institutions. Ian has contributed to a range of international publications, panels, research, research journals, and think tanks, including the Getty Research Institute, the Arid Lands Institute, and the Milken Institute. And then uh, lastly, uh, to moderate this conversation, we have Luciana Varkolja, who is an architect and urban designer in Brazil, who has worked on projects in the US and internationally under her practice, UMA Architecture and Design. She has worked on a variety of project types and scales from furniture design to large institutional and civic buildings, urban design projects, and master plans. Luciana worked as a senior designer at ACOM and SOM as a pro project designer at Allied Works Architecture. She is a lecturer at USC and has taught at Columbia, Otis, and Cal Poly Pomona. So please welcome our panelists and moderator. And Luciana, take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for, we have a great uh, group of speakers tonight. We actually had a warm up conversation this week. So we want to keep it this very, and we had a great conversation uh, in the beginning of this week. So we want to make sure that we bring back some of those uh, topics that we brought up earlier on. Um, and we also want to keep it as very organic, right? We want to make sure that uh, there is no presentation, right? So we, we want to make sure that this is really a very organic conversation. So maybe we can start, like Chuck mentioned, right? We do, we, there is kind of a framework there in terms of past, future, and what is relevant, uh, relevant for this conversation. So if we look at past, so I'm going to write it, uh, bring some ideas to our panelists to, to discuss over here. So um, past, right? So we are looking at how have previous epidemics affected the architecture. So if you look back in the 20, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we have architects and critics talking a lot about tuberculosis. Um, so back then it seemed to be a very good idea to remove the carpets and draperies, all the 19th century uh, ornament, that's maybe all the flues would put on. And then we start to look at um, uh, clean lines uh, from modern architecture, but also uh, something that is some of the ideas coming from order to, to trigger modern architecture was coming from doctors and nurses, right, and hospital architecture, and we were look, really looking into tuberculosis sanatorium. So if you look at the sanatorium as this seed, right, as a laboratorium back in modern architecture, uh, and we have uh, Philip Lovell uh, commissioning Schindler and Neutra, to create houses that blurry the, the boundary, right, between interior and exterior. So let's, if we go back to what we are living today, I wonder, and that's a question that I wanna put for our panelists, right? If we do have, uh, um, what is the new laboratory for architecture uh, today, right? And I would say also urban design, are we looking at uh, new styles, right? What we are living right now, is that gonna be triggering new, uh, typologies. So what are we envisioning? And I open that for the discussion with our panelists. I don't mind diving in on the past a little bit. Um, thanks, Luciana and Chuck and Carlo for inviting me and all of us to talk tonight. Um, you know, when you look at the past epidemics, it has as much to do with the history of medicine as it does with the you know, responses we give to it. And I think that we see that true now as well, that we don't fully understand the virus. And so there are all kinds of, um, you know, by month, we think it's different things. First, we had to have a touchless office. Now we need to make better ventilation. So as we're trying to understand this virus better, we are adapting architecturally to 
uh, how to respond. And that was really true at the time you mentioned, Luciana. At the turn of the century, it was really just, uh, I think, in the 1880s when the germ, the bacteria for tuberculosis was discovered. The cure didn't come until 1940, but it's with this idea of germ theory where the uh, disease rests in the body and it's kind of like our fault, our problem versus the prior theory, which was miasma theory, which was that it was in the air and the ventilation and the light and the environment and the rugs. And so then there was this idea that the way the environment was established would prevent the disease from traveling or from moving to the next individual. And so the environment was really the problem. I think now we see, and really it's through the tuberculous model that Beatrice Colomina really rewrote the entire history of modernism through the lens of tuberculosis, that modernism is the result of tuberculosis from her argument. And it's a pretty interesting 180 <laughs> on why we have glass and why the walls are white and why there's a lot of connections between indoors and outdoors. Um, and that's because it was this combination of germ theory and environment that set a whole new uh, architecture into motion. You know, that followed so many other pandemics and because there was such a revolution in the science, it's hard to imagine that our current pandemic might spawn the same kind of radical results. Uh, but I do think that you can look to say tenement law in New York as the same exact phenomenon, which is as people saw um, disease spreading from the people who were othered, especially the immigrant populations living in tenements to the people who were in power and there was no boundary that was going to maintain the disease. It was no, not gonna get contained in the people without power. It was gonna spread just like this disease is spreading all across the country. Then the solutions had to become more pervasive. So it changed building codes, you know, they. Not only did they change um, in the turn of the century, you know, after Jacob Rees and medicine uh, showed what cholera and typhus were doing, they not only changed building laws for more light and air, but they cut 40,000 windows in existing buildings in order to open it up, which is, I've never read much about that, but now I'd like to have some student write a paper about that. It'd be really interesting to see. I think, Dana, that raises an interesting point in my mind, because we're dealing both with whether, whether the new directions of, of architecture, what's the new directions of housing, but you look at downtown Los Angeles or, or Manhattan, what do we do with, you know, 40 story high rises? What do we do with, with office buildings? What do we do with, you know, theaters? I mean, the, the movie theater is probably going to be something of, of the past, but it's the anchor of a major, a major mall or major urban space. Um, where, where does that take us? How do we adjust to both of those yeah. dichotomies? Take the roofs off. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and from my point of view, I don't think we really need to look to new models. I think for me, this pandemic just reinforces what we've been saying for a long time. Um, and I did a little bit of research before this panel and even going back you know, before the 19th century and 18th century to the bubonic plague, in the 14th century, which literally killed about 60% of Europe's population, the way that they solved that after all these people died was quarantining and social isolation. And that's exactly what we're doing now. And so, you know, as Dana said, a lot of citywide um, infrastructure changes were made as we kind of went through these centuries of pandemics, you know, tenement reform, waste management reform, but, um, you know, ironically, 100 years ago, we used to build buildings in a much better way. So we built buildings 100 years ago with courtyards and narrow floor plates, spaces got natural light and ventilation from both sides, and they were called alphabet buildings. And then we got selective amnesia. The 1960s came about, the 50s and 60s, and the advent of air conditioning. And then we just like threw that out the window. So we have these buildings, which are terrible buildings because they don't have these narrow floor plates. You can't get cross ventilation and light in them. 
Um, in Florida, you know, they're her hermetically sealed with mechanical systems that just process this air around. So in Florida, several years ago, there was a mold problem and people were getting sick from mold, but it's because we have these unhealthy buildings. And it's not like we need a new model. I think we have to look back at what we used to do and look back to some old models um, to maybe start, maybe start creating policies around how to do better buildings and more healthy buildings. Um, I was on a panel yesterday for the ULI with Ken Greenberg, who used to be the, he's a former director of um, the urban designer for, the, for Toronto. And he said the link between lack of walkability, that there is a link between lack of walkability and COVID outbreaks, and that the COVID outbreaks are occurring because of overcrowding. And so what they're seeing is even in areas that are of a lower density, it's, those it's the houses that have three generations of people in them. A lot of people where they're seeing COVID outbreaks. And so I think people are talking about, oh, let's move to the suburbs to this area where we're not as dense. But I think what this pandemic is really telling us is that we have to look back at the principles of what he calls a 20 minute neighborhood. And I think um, a lot of you probably know what that is, which is where you have a neighborhood where um, you live in a denser environment, but it's easy to access things without a car. It's, you know, bikeable, it's walkable, um, but that is really expensive for a lot of people today. So I live in a neighborhood that's like that and I couldn't afford to live in my neighborhood today if I had to buy my house today or you know where I live. So I think we have to talk about the right to housing and that goes back to policy to me. So I think it's a help. I think the good thing is we're in a crisis and I think cities respond to uh, emergencies better than they do climate change, which you know it takes a long time for us to see the effects of it. So if we're in a crisis and we wanna solve it, I think if we, if we pose this as a health outcome, making better cities and making healthier buildings and change the way our policies are structured, that that's really a direction that we should go in. I, I think it was um, very scary, the things that you were talking about at first where people were fleeing to the suburbs and isolating and all that. But I think the, the change that's very exciting to me is watching how uh, cities are now engaging the streets. And it's, you know, you just have to drive anywhere and um, parking spaces are becoming uh, outdoor dining and um, people are really living in the street. And um, I think you all have mentioned that sort of what's old is new again, that suddenly we want light and air and we wanna be, uh, see people, but be somewhat isolated. But the fresh air is the thing that's, um, that's going to save us. And it's um, very encouraging to see how it's, it's going to be. And then um, when you look at how much space in the cities are, particularly in California, are being devoted to, um, to cars, then you think, oh, now there's all this space that we can start using for other things, not just dining, but perhaps on the bigger boulevards, you know, having more housing or having sort of a, a central strip of housing. And there, I think there are all sorts of uh, opportunities that are coming from this as well. I think that what the panel is kind of aptly identified here, maybe the thread between is just what is fundamental to these issues, which we sometimes forget in our responses where we'll immediately jump to kind of superficial or very kind of topical um, immediate type solutions rather than those that are kind of based upon kind of deeper social models or things that kind of are maybe more embedded or ingrained in our DNA um, to begin with. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's perhaps, you know, as, as, as an architect, you've got to remain optimistic in all situations. <laughs> it's kind of the fuel that fires us or, uh, you know, fuel that fuels us maybe. Um, and so, you know, to try to take a sense of optimism away from these situations, I think that it forces us to really kind of um, challenge what are those beliefs that we hold dear and what are we as a profession um, focused on when these sorts of challenges come up. And so instead of you know, immediately jumping to engineering type solutions or very kind of superficial or very kind of like one-to-one -one type solutions are these opportunities to rethink some of the more kind of fundamental um, challenges that the, the, the way that we've elected to self-organize and the way that we've elected to interact with each other and the way that we've, you know, um, elected to interact with our environment may be better places to start um, where there's a greater opportunity to have a kind of more lasting impact rather than dealing with these in a more kind of circular fashion. 
And I think what Angie was describing as well is again, one of those kind of fundamental ethics that is like how we just live in balance with our environment, you know, instead of trying to overwhelm, instead of trying to combat, instead of trying to fight all this terminology that is used when we're dealing with these sorts of crises. And it's not to kind of undermine or to diminish the, the, the kind of, you know, impact that, that this has been. Um, but not to allow that to rush to crisis mode where we start trying to put out fires rather than understanding what is starting them to begin with. Um, and so I see this as an amazing opportunity for us all as architects and urban designers and people that are in social sciences and other fields, of course, as well, um, to be able to kind of rethink fundamentally what it is that we're doing and what are the conversations that we're contributing to. Um, and hopefully it's, it's a time that we're able to use this attention, use this energy, use this emphasis and focus um, to improve uh, our cities, to improve our social environments, to improve the way that we interact with each other on a more kind of deeply human uh, scale uh, beyond just making sure that we stay six feet apart from each other, or wash our hands, which are probably, <laughs> at least the washing the hands part is something that we should probably take into the future regardless of a pandemic. So I, I wanna, um... I think this is great for us to start. Uh, actually, we're already talking uh, about many, many things that I was planning to point out. And I think all of you guys brought up uh, something. Uh, I think going back to some of the things that uh, Angel brought up, right? I think when we're looking at typologists in, in other centuries where you have the courtyard, right? We know that now with this um, airborne um, transmission, we have to enhance natural ventilation and even uh, like you, everybody is mentioning, right? We have to um, change the, the idea of space and, and social distance, right? So how exactly do that? If we have conversations to solve housing crisis in LA, right? And LA that is um, a city well known for the uh, single family typology, right? 75% of the city um, with that typology. So I think many of us, we are in favor of densifying the grid and now we have this friction in terms of, okay, how do we do that if we have to have more space? And we, we've seen, uh, I'm sure that everybody who's on this panel, but also uh, in the audience, we've seen reports saying how in New Jersey, right? There, was li there were lines uh, of people trying to see um, house opening, right? So there is this rush, this fear of the rush of, people to the suburbia, right? A new um, people searching for this place where they can really find more space. And then um, CBDs, right? The center business district becoming empty again. And I think to some of the things that Barry brought up, I think that could be also blank canvas for, and um, Alina also mentioned, right? Of many new in field for house and opportunity. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear from all of you, how do we deal with that extremes, right? We have to densify the grid at the same time, we need more space. And I think Alan brought some of the ideas, okay, we, we're going to have to go to the public space, right? We're going to have to, to, to negotiate with public realm and see if we can get some of that space that we might not find inside, but then the, the, right, there is a crowd, crowd of spaces inside especially if we start to talk about income level. So how do we deal with all that, right? And I, I think another thing that we, I wanna also brought up that um, downtown LA, right? During the eighties, there was an ordinance to, to, to really create a, a new infill for housing. Also um, people who decided to live downtown LA, they also were attracted by the nightlife and right? the, the clubs and the, the movie theaters and the bars and the coffee shops. And now all those services, right? Those amenities, they were affected. And suddenly um, maybe living downtown LA is, was also affected, right? Because that everything that supports that living model, model is, 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 is also, going through some level of transition right now. So I think I'm bringing all that. And, and again, right, I think I wanna pose more of the discussion, how do we deal with all those different variables of this equation, right? And, and where, where we, what, what is the vision for, where do we go from here? One of the things that I think as architects, we could do well to communicate or educate about is this like, 
big concept of density that everyone, especially in LA, seems to feel is a threat. Um, but and it's in terms of the epidemic, the part of density that's a threat is internal density, right? I think uh, Angie and Aline brought that up, that it's how crowded it is inside the unit. And that's historically been true. <laughs> you know, uh, epidemics- People, people spread, density, right? People, people density. density. Inside the unit, but not external density like dwelling units per acre. So really the more external density we can get with open space around it, the more healthy the city could be. So there's no contradiction in my mind between a dense city and a healthy city, right. especially when we have LA, in LA where we have the beach, you know what I mean? Yeah. In New York, you have Central Park, but here it was when the mayor wouldn't open the beaches that it seemed so inequitable. Once the beaches mm -hmm. got open, so everyone had access to them, not just the crust of wealthy people who live along it, then there's space for everyone to get a little of the lungs of the city model mm -hmm. uh, into the open space, so. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and, you know, when you look at our city, I think with every remote working, I don't think is going to go go away. You know, as a small business owner, I was really resistant to people working from home. And I have to be completely honest with you. And then the pandemic came and everyone went home and started working from home. And I thought, wow, this is really working out. You know, there's like no problem at all. And people are happier because they don't have to commute in every day to the office. And so we are actually offering it to people. We're going to let people work at least three days a week from their house if they want. And we have a structure where certain people come in one day a week, other people come in another day of the week so that we can still kind of be spaced apart. Um, but it just makes everybody much happier. And you don't need to see everybody every day, eight hours a day. Um, but with that remote working and with everybody being kind of socially isolated, I think our public spaces are that much more critical. So our spaces that are our parks and this idea of this 20 minute neighborhood of biking everywhere, and those become really more important. So um, in Venice, where I live, the streets, to me, streets are for people and not for cars, but it's been really difficult to get cities and um, you know the Bureau of Engineering I know we just narrowed streets recently. The mobility plan 2035 actually narrowed the streets in LA, which was a good thing. Um, but we still have, you know, we see people taking over the one lane of parking on Main Street, for instance, all the restaurants for outdoor seating, and then people cutting hair outside, people doing a lot outside. Um, but then there's also the homeless problem that we have. So, you know, we have 70,000 people living unsheltered outside on the sidewalks, but then we have a lot of people who are living in their cars or in their campers. And in Venice, we actually have campers, people living in campers um, on the streets who are renting out other campers to other home people who are sheltered homeless across the street. So we have this whole uh, industry of people living on the streets and there's now a fight between who's, who owns the street and who can live in the street and who can't live in the street. And so I think we really have to think about, we have to get everybody housed. I think that is really, I don't think anybody disagrees with that. And then how to do it is probably where people disagree. And I think if we look at the city of LA, if there's 50 to 75%, and I'm not sure exactly what it is of single family zoning, um, that's 85, 85. Oh my God. So prop U. I don't know, um, Dana, you might know about prop U. So in 19, we have what we call commercial boulevards throughout the city. And if you look at the zoning map of the city, they're pink. Um, in 1987, there was a ballot measure and Zeb Yaroslavsky was one of the supervisors who, who brought this forward and wanted it. People were concerned about traffic. And so in our commercial boulevards, all these pink lines on the zoning map, the FAR was three to one. So that's the floor area ratio. So if you build a building on your whole site, you can build a three-story building. Um, if you have some land, you know, you could build a smaller six-story building, but three to one is not, I don't think it's a very, very dense FAR, but that's what our commercial boulevards were. In 1987, a ballot measure, the voters voted to decrease that by half, by 50%. So we literally, by 50%, reduced the available building that architects could build to house people, and it's never gone back. And so I really think we need to repeal Prop U, which would just overnight give us back what we had in 1987 to allow us to build along these boulevards. Um, but then we also, I think, have to think about affordability. 
and I'm going to stop talking so somebody else can can talk. <laughs> I complete completely agree with 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 all that's been said, and and I think that these are important directions to be able to take these conversations. I think one moment of quick reflection as it relates to kind of you know what responses are available to us that deserves acknowledging is that it's really stressed the social inequalities that exist within our society and what resources, what responses are actually available to, to all people. And so talking about working from home, even talking about access to certain parts of the city or certain amenities, I think that those things really become central, at least in my mind, is things that we have to be able to acknowledge, address, you know, in a wholehearted and honest way and be able to improve upon so these other kind of fantastic, um, you know, things are able to, to manifest for, for, for everybody's, um, you know, betterment. And I know that that's the forefront of everybody's thinking and on everybody's mind and, and, and a huge part of the dialogue, which I think is really important, really, really healthy for us to not miss these opportunities to be able to have these sorts of discussions. Um, you know, somewhat kind of like, you know, comedically, it came up on the primer conversation that we had the other day but really for a lot of us, I think that have been engaged in this type of work for a long time, you know, a lot of these things are things that we've been shouting from the rooftops for years and been advocating for in our work and have been presenting in our work and lecturing to and speaking to and writing to and every outlet, everybody that would listen to us, the importance of these things. And I think, you know, Dana, I believe used the, the, the word the other day, this idea of subversion and the importance of being able to use these as opportunities to be able to improve on other instances that may be slightly tertiary or slightly secondary, but are really kind of influential and important in being able to make any sort of real lasting change. And so, you know, as, as, as uh, you know, has been discussed here, it's, it's things that are just kind of fundamental to the ethics that we bring to a project. And so be it spatial, be it organizational, be it social, be it environmental, all these issues are you know having an opportunity to be able to be heard by a different um, group of people from a different set of ears from a slightly different perspective and I think that it's a really important moment kind of across the board politically and socially and from a design perspective for us to be able to take advantage of some of these moments that we have to be able to make real and lasting um, change and, 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 and again and being able to kind of really benefit from what we do and and I would suggest that we even potentially take it a step further in that we need to challenge what domestic life in general is and and who we are as a society and how um you know these inherited models that we've um you know taken on as, as architects be they urban in response to previous pandemics or previous issues be they architectural thinking about residential and non-residential typology I think that we have just evolved as a society and as people, and we need to be able to kind of embrace new ways that people live. And in doing so, think about how domestic space can find its way into the public realm. Think about how public space can find its way into the domestic realm and really kind of recognize the blur that truly kind of exists based upon use patterns, not just based upon zoning patterns um, that are in all of our societies. And, and I think that if we're able to have that sort of kind of formative change, that, that it's a really fantastic time for us all to be able to contribute to those conversations and to be designers um, at this moment as well. Big responsibility, but big opportunity. I, I think you know, many of the things you said were great, but the thing that hit me was how long this problem has been going on. And th so there are two sides to that. One is, so, you know, for me, I've been working in the field of affordable housing for 30 years. And I think many of us um, are somewhere around that. Um, but it's also, we keep looking at this as a temporary problem and it's obviously not. You know, it's gotten worse be uh, because of COVID and sometimes you can um, jump on that, and, you know, use that as a catalyst. I think that's what you were saying you know, um, as well. But um, the... <laughs> So this is the non-architect side that's talking. Um, the big problem is money. Well, there's money, there's will, we'll get into that. But um, so about 30 years ago, uh, I heard uh, the author Jonathan Kozel speak. And he said, oh, I have really, you know, to a bunch of liberals and I was like, I have really great news for you. There's enough money. And everybody's like, yeah. And then he said, the only problem is getting it from your pocket to their pocket. Oh, the um, oxygen went out of the air. But there needs to, uh, obviously, 
getting more money, getting the government to think about it, but there are also like administrative things that need to change. Um, things like uh, inclusionary housing, where you tell people, oh, you can build housing, but you also need to include 20% or some large percent of affordable. Um, there needs to be a CEQA reform. We need to understand that there are NIMBYs and just for um, your amusement, it's not just NIMBYs, not in my backyard, but they're also um, nope, people are called nope, not on planet earth and bananas um, uh, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. So um, this is, uh, there are uh, many, many ways to approach this problem. And as architects, I know that we want to build our way out of it, but um, there, think of, I mean, Angie, I think you probably know um, better than anyone, how long it takes to get projects through, how neighborhoods are allowed to, you know, screw around with things, whether it's, you know, affordable housing, historic preservation, there are all kinds of ways that people are, are trying to defeat us. And, um, and then also just two non-architectural ways to change things are, that involve money, of course, are uh, rental assistance and also changing the minimum wage because, and this is my last thought, um, the median income in Los Angeles is $77,000. The median income for renters is about $47,000 a year, but the housing wage is $50 an hour and uh, that's like hundred over $100,000 a year. So cha changing things like minimum wage, which probably aren't, we don't even think about will change uh, housing availability. I, I agree with everything that everyone said. I just want to sort of bring it back to what can we do as, as architects? Because I don't think we'll solve um, the minimum wage within, and maybe within the AIA we can. Um, but in the broader, broader picture, I don't think we can. Um, but I, I think a lot of it, you know, density is possible because there is a lot of open space that we're not designing, we're not programming. I think if we sort of take you know, a step back and look at how do we program the open space that's available to us so that in fact serves the density we're trying to, to reinforce that, that people, I was in a conversation with someone from Montana the other day who said, oh my God, people in Bozeman, Montana, you know, housing prices have gone up hundred percent because people are coming out from New York suddenly and they wanna live someplace where it's clean air and, and safe. And he said, we give them about six months before they realize that Bozeman, Montana doesn't have the art, the theater, the food, the culture that, that they, they really are used to. And I think people, now that they're living downtown, now, now that sort of downtown's come back from, from where it was, I think people will come back to it if we design you know, social open spaces, not, not streets. If we design you know, in, in within the, the, the mixed use housing uh, that's going up, you know, maybe the open space doesn't want to be a swimming pool. Maybe it wants to become a more social open space that people have actually use as opposed to, you know, show up well in, you know, the rental brochure, but never gets, never gets, you know, occupied. So I think, you know, even, even things within existing residential neighborhoods, we have the main commercial streets, which form a major grid through the city, but does every residential street that goes between those commercial streets, between those boulevards need to be a two-way traffic street, could they be reduced to one-way traffic and, and by a lane of, of additional open space that can become usable to, uh, you know, to, to, to pedestrians, usable to expand your front yard, create a social place on, on with, within the, the overall grid. And I think we need to look at, you know, some of those bigger design opportunities and see where we can find them, not only as we design new projects, new, new work, but where are those opportunities within the existing context of the city? Sometimes when you work like Barry's talking about, it it pays off to be a, a real collaborator. And maybe in a pandemic is one of the times when architects could be part of the teams that are needed to make the kind of changes you're talking about. You know, if they're really, how long have we been talking about trying to help solve the housing problem for our unhoused neighbors? Uh, you know, when Garcetti came in, he said, you know, if it was an earthquake, we would have 50, and we had 50,000 people on the street, we would 
find them houses. Well, maybe this is the earthquake. You know, maybe the pandemic is a way in which we start to really contribute as architects into these larger conversations of how to deal with the true crises that is really inequitable as a number of people have said already in terms of especially black and brown lives in the city who are more likely to be represented on the streets, who are more likely to live in overcrowded conditions, who are more likely to have bad health care, And all of that comes out of a long, you know, racist practices of our own making our federal government. Uh, and, you know, everybody knows the story of redlining by now, but I think maybe we could organize uh, to actually be part, have architecture be one of the levers that contributes to the solution that's reaching pretty unbelievable proportions right now. Yeah, I think the canary in the coal mine in regards to both the degree of commitment in terms of time as well as the range of responses that have already been put in place and how those are an indication of the kind of you know degree of investment and also the kind of term in which we're planning on having in a sort of lasting change um, are, are really really telling and and you know there was a, a great conversation that came up the other day about um, you know the the homeless population and 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 you know how you know that is certainly you know arguably probably the most vulnerable population in returns of what the responses have been from a city standpoint um, or for you know other kind of uh, you know jurisdictions that exist as well and you know largely the response has been more porta potties you know and if there is ever an indication of kind of the real willingness to be able to even in these moments of crisis, take this on as a kind of, you know, uh, you know, the true crisis that it is um, and recognize these things, not to use a bad term at the moment, but as symptoms of a sickness, right? Like truly is something that we are kind of tiptoeing around. Um, I think it's in these moments and, and even, I mean, again, you know, the, the range of responses as it has, has existed or been presented to date with types of um, conversions of open space, you know, in, 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 in my neighborhood, um, you know, they've put out, you can see them, you know, on Google Maps, you know, promoted and everything like that. But it's like those sandwich board signs that just says this is a walk street now, or this is, you know, public space or whatever it may be, but there's no other permanent commitment to that thing or lasting and people move them or people take them down. And so I just think that, you know, all these things that are initial responses, early indication are really telling in regards to the magnitude of change that is actually being sought. Um, and I think that again, before we have this time pass us, we have to be able to kind of challenge um, what truly is being invested, what are the resources that are being presented toward dealing with this um, in the immediate, but also uh, over a longer term, because, you know, currently it, it feels like it's being treated like a very temporary condition, um, which is unfortunate. You know, when tenement reform happened, it took 40 years. And, you know, we look back on that and think, wow, that was amazing. You know, there was Jacob Reese's book in 1905. And, you know, really it brought everything to light and that really transformed the city and made more open space and made better living conditions and made more sanitary conditions, improved the sewers. But it really was a 40 year project, but they did it. <laughs> so I don't think we should feel like this is an impossible situation or that this isn't the crisis to use to start that 40 year process to really, and. To me, one of the things architects could do is really to expand the continuum of accommodation so that we're not just always trying to build, though we all think of housing first is the answer, a full apartment where you have permanent housing. We need to invent the things in between living on the street and getting your $650,000 affordable unit, or we're never going to get there. And if that has to do with pod share, if it has to do with safe parking, if it has to do with urban hubs where people can get water and power and showers, you know, all of those things could be part of what architects could do to show what's possible and, you know, open the future to new opportunities for solving, you know, the worst of this housing condition and which is where the worst of the pandemic is. 
Okay. Um, uh, but, I, I, go ahead. Uh, uh, so I'm so happy to hear uh, Ian speak about the porta potties because um, Skid Row has been Skid Row for what over a hundred years, Dana? Yeah, for sure. And you know, to think that somebody dares to do that as a temporary project is crazy. But um, I. I like the idea, Dana, that maybe we can say, oh, well, we'll just put in, you know, thousands and thousands of nice one bedroom apartments. But, you know, what, what is there that, that's humane and, and reasonable and thinking, oh, all those campgrounds that sort of have you have those plug in things and yet there's, you know, toilets and showers that everybody can use. I don't know if that's a reasonable model, but, um, you know, some somehow making things more accessible, and but we do tend to over design things. So when you see architects designing for small spaces, you know everything like flips out and uh, unrolls, and you know everything is hidden, and it's so it's like a piece of jewelry. So maybe we can tone that down and and look at um, quick, inexpensive um, solutions that are. Um, that are really human, humane and humanistic. I, I think part of it may be we need to expand what our definition is of, of housing. Mm -hmm. Is housing just you know shelter? Is it just putting a roof over someone's head, or is housing also you know, creating a community and a social structure that sort of reinforces? Um, so shelter isn't the, the be all and end all. It's obviously the critical component, but but there's more to housing than just the roof. I think. I think as architects, that's one of the things we can bring to the conversation of, you know, housing comes with open space, it comes with social interaction, it comes with, with um, you know, circulation, it comes with, you know, the, the, the 20 minute walk. Those are all part of the definition of housing. Expanding the definition of architecture. Yeah, exactly. as, well, as far as the range of possibilities to the conversations that are, you know, maybe way of thinking or way of seeing or, or you know, way of going about existing on this planet, you know, presents opportunities and advantages in some of these other bigger conversations. I, I, I completely agree. One of the things that I see is that we have a lack of alternative models of housing. So when we get nonprofit clients who want us to build housing, they say, um, you know, we want a studio apartment or one bedroom apartment or a two bedroom apartment. And no one's talking about shared housing models or, mo or you know, you go to Europe, there's, we, you can, we can think of, we can sit here and think of 25 different housing models and we don't do it here. So um, I think that, you know, we're designers. I think that's what we do. And I think it's just convincing people that it's a good idea or showing people what it looks like. So I think, um, and last year our firm had an exhibit at the 18th Street Art Gallery called Density, Housing for Quality of Life and Social Capital. And some of the images are behind me on the screen, on my uh, virtual background, but it was really because we were so frustrated that we were getting, we were going to public hearings where we were trying to build a building that was only four stories high and the public was coming out saying, oh my gosh, it's too tall, it's too dense. And there was this lack of understanding of what density means and what um, the links between density and the 20 minute neighborhood and housing. And, you know, people who have single family houses and wanna live in what they consider the suburb, they wanna live there, but they also want all of the benefits of what a 20 minute neighborhood will give you. And you cannot live in a suburb and get the benefits of a 20 minute neighborhood. It just doesn't work that way. So I think um, what the exhibit did was it showed people, this is what density looks like. And so we, we, did, we researched a lot, we showed examples. And one of the things that we discovered was that the available housing that we have built um, most of it are three bedroom apartments or houses. And if you look at the households themselves, 20, only 20% 20 or less of them are actually nuclear families. So most of us are single people or single people living together. Um, and so what we need are these housing models that are things like micro units. We've done micro units that are 245 square feet each where people, you know, we have to house everyone. And if we don't look at these alternative models of housing, we're never going to get everyone housed. And I think there are people who want to live in these alternative housing models. We've also done a shared housing model where the units themselves where people actually live are rooms that just have a refrigerator and a sink and that's it. And then there are showers on every floor or bathrooms that people share. And then there's a <clears throat> ground floor that has a kitchen and people share a place to eat. 
there are models in other countries that actually someone wrote a book called the kitchenless house. So you live in a place that doesn't have a kitchen, but the kitchen is something that is shared by other people. And it allows you to live in a denser, denser situation, um, but also for a very, very low rent. So, you know, it's all tied together. It's, you know, if you want to live in a $3,000 um, a month single family house, you can go live in that. But if you want, if you're a student, or if you're a college student and you want to live in a 20 minute neighborhood, maybe you want a variety of rent levels. And so we have to think about these alternative housing models. And the only way to explain it to people is to really draw it and show it to people. So part of the exhibit was that. And at the end of it, so many people came, hundreds of people came. There were articles written about it, but I was asked to be interviewed on the local TV channel for Santa Monica. And then I was asked to present in front of the housing commission and talk about density and talk about what that meant. And so I think it would be great for us to do more of that to explain to the public what it looks like, you know, what it what it could be and what those models actually actually look like. And I think that would really help a lot. And part of that explanation is expanding the nomenclature that we use or the language that we use. You know, it's not bedroom, it's sleep. It's not kitchen, it's eat. It's kind of these basic fundamental things that we, you know, have as basic human needs and almost going back to that level of thinking, I think is, you know, extremely important as well. I feel that we're so preset in our thinking to suppose certain design responses beyond kind of going back to that most fundamental kind of, you know, primitive almost thinking about, you know, what it means to be community or what it means to be um, individuals and, and, and really kind of expanding that or maybe contracting it back to what those kind of most basic human needs are. So I want to bring some, can I just quickly bring some, it's, it's great because I, I, as the moderator, everyone cannot, I, I'm just enjoying seeing you, you guys talking, but I think I just want to uh, bring something that um, Angie mentioned, right, because I think it's not just about housing models, but it's uh, living models, right, so, um, so I do teach about the sharing economy, right, I'm a believer in the sharing economy, but I also think that we cannot detach about cultural aspect of accepting something like co-living, right? I think co-living in the US is very uh, new, is a new living model, but when we look at affordability and um, homelessness, right? I think affordability has a different kind of umbrella, right? We can have students that are homelessness, uh, uh, homeless, and then we can also have uh, maybe people who are in transitional mode, right? Personally, professionally. So um, I decided to personally, I decided to experience co-living myself. So I was living in a 6,000 square feet single family home in Korean town that was converted to become a 16 people um, co-living space. And I was there for one year, right, until COVID hit. And it definitely, the whole idea of sharing a kitchen became really, really scary. And, and I think at that point, I definitely, right, I, I was the oldest in the house because I think that when we talk about living more, there was also, right, and the cultural aspect that I was mentioning also hit that wall who, who is your audience, right? And how exactly we have to, to engage right now that we have to see that people are, right? They, they're, they don't, maybe they're not gonna be homeowners, right? And like I said, the, those transitional phases in life allows you for us to look at those living models, but it's definitely gonna be different from country to country, right? So I think I wonder if it, living, right, in a co-living space in a shared economy can also trigger a more sustainable approach, but then you're not, uh, you don't have to have a 15 or 16 kitchens, right? We were sharing one kitchen, but um, at the point that we have to practice right now, like social distance or isolation, right? Uh, it became completely uh, a nightmare and I end up running away from, from that. Even being, and I'm now in Sao Paulo, right? So I'm, I'm kind of even be, believing that I wonder how, and, and again, right, I think that's also touched the nerve of accessibility. Because if you look at those new living models, right, where ownership is challenged, uh, how, um, and, and that, those can become more accessible models, right? And how can we look now with the pandemic affecting those living models, right? Even multi-generational housing. So anything that is seen as a crowded versus density that I'm seeing here on the chat, right? Yes, that's a fact. But if living models are options for creating more accessibility, how how those are being challenged right now right and i think all of you guys are saying something that i thought it was very very 
uh, important that we highlight in this conversation that we're gonna have to negotiate that space where, where when we talk about architecture and urban design, right, or urban realm. So we're gonna have to learn as uh, practitioners, right, as uh, researchers, educators, and people and users, right. We're gonna have to find that balance now, which is very fascinating. That we we really gonna. It's not just about redesigning. Um, space right interior space but it's also looking at the city as uh, um, enhancing the right that, that square footage potentially but I think I also I'm, I'm just curious if we're the word accessibility right how how do we how do we bring accessibility in all this conversation as well Especially looking, I, I don't know, I brought the living models, right? But I think in the beginning of the conversation, we talk about real estate also, right? If, if there is a change, if a living uh, closer, right? A 20 minute city or 15 minute city like Paris, right? If, if we want to live closer, it implies we, we cannot not look at real estate is also something that will affect those, those new, new uh, spatial conditions, right? Look how we got the real estate we're somehow upholding as the model. It's so, uh, it's such a travesty in a way. So it comes after World War II. I mean, okay, maybe we go back to Andrew Jackson Downing, but basically starting in World War II, there's an entire system that produces the nuclear family. And that means there's a husband and a wife and there's two and a half kids. You know, we all know that uh, narrative which has nothing to do with, I think something like 80% of households don't fit that anymore. So we still have that and we still uphold it because it's part of a speculative real estate system and lenders have pushed it to that. And um, the, you know zoning pushes it to that. So we have all these pieces that actually don't have anything to do with like the pandemic, our lives, any of our thoughts about this, um, you know, range of architectural solutions that uh, Angie was talking about. So th that's why I feel like we really have to get in front of people and uh, negotiate alternatives, alternative ways out of this. And I think showing people possibilities is a really uh, a skill we have and the creative imagination that's in this Zoom space is something that can be harnessed towards actually opening up new possible futures. Because without that, we're going to produce more Westchester, you know, more Thousand Oaks. And, you know, I don't think any of us are particularly interested in doing that since it actually has very little to do with contemporary needs. So to me, the industries that surround the work we do have to be cracked open. I think have, we can do that. I don't think that's impossible. Well, ha having grown up in, in Westchester, uh, I resemble that comment. <laughs> um, but, but I think, you know, Dana might be onto something that, that maybe this pandemic is, is our World War II in terms of changing the way society, the way you know, urban fabric is structured. I, don't, I never thought of it that way. But in fact, yeah, World War II brought us Levittown, brought us, you know, the San Fernando Valley as, as residential as opposed to farmland. And maybe this is... The opportunity that as architects, as designers, as, as planners, as politicians, we can sort of bring it back into something which is more appropriate to a sustainable living condition, you know, the, the 20 minute, the 20 minute village. Yeah, and maybe we right size those suburban houses so that instead of the suburban house continuing to grow, which again has something to do with speculation more than anybody's needs, you know, if you have a four bedroom, four bath house, that can be four studio apartments. And one of the projects that Australian architects are working on right now is this idea of right sizing so that you go back, you know, take it back uh, rather than just accept things as they are. I love that idea, Barry. Yeah, and I think it was this, uh, I think it was Cincinnati that actually had a policy that was called the, the snob ordinance and they said that if a city did not meet a certain threshold of affordability that they would impose an ordinance that anyone could build um, anything and I'm assuming and they could take a single family house and turn it into four apartments um, by right without any entitlements 
And so it was sort of like you had to always kind of keep that level of affordability in your cities. But one of the um, interesting things that's happening in Florida are these things called land trusts. So um, what it does is it decouples the land from the housing so that you don't get into this speculative nature of things costing an arm and a leg. So the city would come in and buy a large parcel or the city could go and buy a bunch of suburban lots somewhere and then they could actually do something with it but the land would be owned by either a nonprofit or a city agency or whoever and it would be and they even do it as small single parcels also in Florida there are larger parcels or single parcels and the land is owned and it's kept affordable and then the house is what um, people have the equity in. Um, so land trusts, I don't think are, are big out here at all, but I think that's a model that we should, we should look at. Oh, bye Dana. I think bye, Dana. Dana's leaving. Hi, thanks for having me. Sorry, I'll miss, I'll listen to the recording. <laughs> thanks Dana. So Angie earlier brought up um, that oh, people are, uh, frightened of size and four stories versus three stories and that. And then that coupled with Barry talking about reusing office buildings. Um, it's like, oh, there are a number of building types that are really um, maybe in the totally in the future, not going to be useful or people will use them in different ways. And um, looking at office buildings and um, shopping malls as potential for getting that density, but people will, you know, maybe they'll accept it because it's in a different form. So I think that's, um, that's something that we should definitely keep looking at. Yeah, you know, in Hawthorne, where our studio is, the Hawthorne Mall, which is this huge, huge structure, is completely empty. Mm -hmm. And it's been empty for several years. We had a client who came to us, um, a charter school actually, and said they wanted to put a charter school in it. And when we looked at the plan of this mall and we actually put the charter school in it, it was just in one little part of it. <laughs> I mean, it's just so huge. And it literally, when you look at Hawthorne before the mall was there, Hawthorne was that 20 minute neighborhood. And they had the um, electric car went all the way down there and they had a, you know, a main street and they just this beautiful little main street. And then the mall came in and it literally just blew out all of the small storefronts and it's now one solid wall along the main street there. So, you know, I think we do need to look at, and I think if someone were to take, I still think it's a big, it's a city issue. It's like, I really don't, I'm an architect, but I really don't feel like spending my time on small parts of the problem because I think the, the problem and the solution is a much bigger thing. And I really feel like I need to spend my time on the bigger picture. Um, so um, I don't know, I just lost my train of thought that, you know, I think it's a much bigger issue. So for instance, like if you look at the whole city, how many empty buildings do we have in the city? Like who knows that, you know, why, why don't we know where all the empty buildings are and why isn't someone talking to the owner of that empty building so that we can do something with that empty building? You know, I know we're thinking about taking our convention center now and putting homeless people in the convention center just because we have so many homeless people outside, but it's, but why can't we repeal Prop U, right? And double the density of all of our mixed use boulevards overnight and just say, just leave it to the market and just say, um, if you're gonna d develop anything in this pink zone, you have to provide 20% affordable housing or something. So then you get your inclusionary zoning and you let the private developers do what they do. And the city council could repeal Prop U. Um, it was a ballot measure, but the city can actually repeal it. So it's something that the city can do. And I just don't think that there's the political will yet to kind of tackle the big problem. So I've been kind of thinking about ways to kind of around the edges, talk to council members or uh, talk to the city council as a whole about these bigger issues. Um, because I think if we really tackle those issues, you know, I love Los Angeles and I've lived here for 30 years and it's such a beautiful place, but I think we have so much opportunity here. You know, over the last couple of decades, we have down zoned and we have reduced the amount of area we have and within which people can live. And so we really need to kind of look at our city and we have to show people what our city is gonna look like in a hundred years or 50 years. And no one has really done that citywide to look at kind of the policies and what the city is gonna look like 
in the future. And once somebody does that and we start to kind of make these changes, I think it'll be a much better, better place to live and we'll solve a lot of these problems. Um, but it's more of an, ur you know, it's a big urban kind of issue. And so I'm not sure who's going to tackle that issue, but these are things that I've been thinking about. We all are, right? <laughs> a call to action. I, 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 I mean, there, there's a lot there. And, and, and again, like the range of scale that you're able to have influence on, you know, really kind of varies. But I think one of the things that you learn quickly working in affordable housing as an architect is the um, degree of influence that you're able to have within that conversation by fighting it at a face value, meaning like homelessness only as a lack of housing and trying to create more housing than there are people that are homeless rather than understanding it as a systematic issue that requires a whole other um, cast of improvements and different thinking as well. And I think one of the things that you know we've enjoyed with the um, affordable housing policy that we've been able to be involved in both here in LA and, and also to a degree in Detroit, which is a completely different condition when you talk about density, but but shares, you know, similar um, sets of issues as well, is um, how you're able to contribute that kind of in-game thinking to what is forming policy or, or political thinking. Um, and, and, you know, some of the work that we're doing right now in a really fantastic way, and it's, it's to the city's credit to a degree, um, is looking at these underutilized um, land parcels that they have in the city that they're owners of and opening those up um, for affordable housing developers to be able to, to come in. And I can't remember exactly what the number was, but I believe it was in the range of like 1700 parcels or something that they had identified that either based upon, you know, very complicated legal descriptions or proximity to, you know, certain problematic infrastructure pre, uh, historically, but no longer or things like that. These are now, you know, remnants that could be opened up and reactivated for housing. And so, you know, one of the projects that we're currently, we're broken ground on and working on is a affordable housing project in South LA um, with Clifford Beers Housing. Um, is looking at those opportunities and, and it was a bit of a you know process to be able to get there but reactivating what was previously seen as kind of you know inviolable land or, or, or kind of invaluable land um, and, and it doesn't mean that you know any kind of small action is going to take place but you can really start to see how um, you know this taking place across the city could add up and, and kind of contribute to something that may be a little bit more meaningful and a little bit more active um, and, and, you know, it, it's again, like how deep do you go <laughs> into each of these conversations? Like we can start about the whole idea of privatization and public space and, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know our, our capital markets and things like that, but really trying to find ways to be able to bifurcate, um, you know, public systems and private systems, I think is an important step to be able to take as well that, that you see the restrictions that are placed on any sort of publicly funded housing that they kind of have to take the worst of both public and private conditions in order to be able to provide housing. And that's one of the main reasons why you see the costs at the rate that they currently are is because they're held to this whole different kind of set of standards. And back to where kind of Luciana begun the conversation about different programmatic options, the restrictions that you're placed under as far as the provision of parking or the provision of very prescriptive unit typologies, you know, that may be completely, completely foreign from where the need currently exists, all these kind of restrictions that are placed um, really, really hinder anyone's ability to be able to kind of truly respond um, to what those challenges are. And so I think the more that we're able to contribute, again, that kind of knowledge that we have and share through going through this process, you know, on numerous occasions, to what is forming the policy and what is forming the thinking. I think that that's where the greatest influence is able to be had. And, and I think that, you know, I get very excited when I hear about new kind of emergent models or, you know, challenging different typologies and thinking about co-living or different shared models and shared economy and things of this nature. I think it's really important to have a degree of skepticism in regards to what are the fundamental forces that is driving that thinking. We in the practice really benefit from working with fantastic clients that obviously have a great share of values that, that we hold as well and we really benefit from that in the work um, but you know a lot of those co-living models are driven 
purely by economic models. It's, it's not done because there's some sort of social agenda that exists there. It's done because if you take a square foot per square foot sale or rental rate on that same unit, they're making, you know, substantially more money on it. And, you know, as we've seen in the past, anything that is based pretty much solely around um, economic conditions driving kind of it from a, from a, from a, you know, kind of, you know, from its DNA, um, you can see how quickly those things start to crumble and leave us in, in pretty rough shape. No, well, those are great points. And I, um, I also want to make sure that we open to the audience for uh, questions, right? So that they can also ask questions um, for all of you. I see here on the chat and I'm kind of trying to follow up. So I ask all the chairs also to help me here. I see Michael Schwartz. He might have a question. I don't know if Michael, if you were out there, see if you want to ask your question live. Is Michael out there? Well, maybe he's in a, he says he's in a different time zone, so maybe, <laughs> maybe he's gonna read. So he's asking hello from Columbus, Ohio. In our region, we've been talking about the urgency of affordable housing for the past 20 years with little concrete action. So much of the issue is seen from deep rooted legacy policies that are one, vastly different from one city to, the, to another, let alone with single uh, municipalities and two, extremely laborious and bureaucratic to resolve or repeal, repel. Uh, what are specific strategies or tactics that can be used to circumvent policy-based issues at scale? Perhaps elaborate on showing people the possibilities. And I, th I, think, I think you guys are, I think, I think if you wanna say something, but I think you, the, the discussion is also going to that direction, right? Do you guys want to? Well, I, I think you know, part of the issue always seems to me that there's a perception of affordable housing as, as being like Pruitt Igo of these sort of massive buildings with, you know, we move poor people into them. And, and the assumption is that because they're poor, they're somehow different from, from you and me. And I think, you know, Pasadena, um, Bill Wang did a lecture for a class that Alien and I teach at, at Cal Poly. And one of the things that, that they've been able to do is to build housing for the homeless um, and demonstrate that in fact, when you take homeless people off the streets and give them housing, not, not just sort of shelter, but, but housing, you know, they, they sort of function as, as full members of, of society, that they don't you know, bring in problems, they don't create problems. You know, the, they, they maintain, they, they, they take care of the housing that's provided for them and in fact, real estate values go up, not down by, by housing the homeless. And I, I think sort of that, that social attitude that goes back to the bigger education of, as architects, you know, we know that the difference between affordable housing and market rate housing is the cost, you know, the rental rate. It, it, it isn't a function of what the housing is or how it looks. You know, and I, I think that, that begins at least get, get the conversation going. I think what you're saying, which is really true, is how you can remove certain social stigmas that exist that have been attached to different housing models as well. I mean, when in this country you think about affordable housing, it's so strongly defined by that term of affordability that it almost limits the potential that it has to be able to be seen as something else and, and, and certainly to kind of be held. And that's something kind of deep seated in our culture that has existed for many generations that hopefully we're turning a corner to be able to work ourselves out of a little bit. Um, but, but there are models that exist. And of course, you know, you usually have to go to a different continent to be able to find, to find them, uh, unfortunately. But, 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 you know, none of this is entirely new and, and our real reluctance to be able to accept the fact that these are proven cases. It's, it's no longer kind of debatable, the fact that, um, you know, uh, what works and what doesn't in combating these challenges. I think that, you know, again, it gets into kind of a deeper conversation around our politics but just there's a disconnect between the cyclical nature of the funding that these projects receive, the political cycles that they fall under as well, and then the kind of time frames that we as architects, urban designers, or anybody really associated with a specific project team is working within. And until we're able to be able to find a greater coherence between those separate conversations, 
um, it's going to be really disjunctive and it's going to be really difficult because we're all kind of solving or aiming to solve the same set of challenges, but in a completely siloed or isolated condition rather than seeing it as more of a continuum. Um, and so that's where the AIA comes in. The AIA could be the glue that binds us all and <clears throat> solves all these problems for us. They could be our uh, champions uh, in, in that regard. Well, Barry, I, I sort of remember that Bill Huang also talk, talked about, and it's similar to something that Angie said, that um, it was very localized, that they sort of did a homeless outreach program and got to know the people and got to know the problems and solving those problems um, on a sort of individual basis. And, um, you know, while Los Angeles is a huge city, it, doesn't mean that each area, you know, that the whole, you know, what, uh, 4 million people in the city are exactly the same and their needs are the same. So trying to figure out, um, you know, like if you're in the center of the city, yeah, there are large households and multi-generational households and those people need larger housing. Um, but they're like, Andrew was talking about, you know, most people that she's thinking of are single family, single people or, um, a parent and a child or two, and they have smaller needs. So sort of looking at things, not as a homeless problem, but as a problem of individuals with uh, different needs might, might be a helpful way. And just one other thought that um, if, if you look at the way that homeless people are now in the city, um, you see sort of individuals um, sort of on the streets and their um, tents but they're all together. So people are finding that there's um, protection being together and uh, somehow or other, you know, people won't uh, uh, attack them or they're safer being together. But at the same time, they're, uh, they have their individual units and, um, and using that as a model, you know, like how can you create a small community with very small things that are individual and then have um, what you don't have on the street of facilities and um, oh, you know um, other other things that that would help. So um, and if you look at uh, what the shelters look like, um, to be honest, I don't think anybody wants to be in a place like that. You know, a giant open space with uh, lots and lots of people who are you know have have problems, have health problems, et cetera, et cetera. So um, looking at um, facilities for the homeless in a different way would be, um, would be advantageous, I think. Yeah, you know, oh, Sorry. I, I just wanted to add um, my, the UL, ULI panel I was on yesterday was really interesting because there was someone from Atlanta um, who, I think she's a real estate agent and it was, a, so, I totally agree with you. Your comments about kind of the localized nature of neighborhoods, I think is really important. So um, at the end of this talk, we were talking about what could ULI members do? And it was really just being, be an advocate for your neighborhood. And in her neighborhood in Atlanta, it was an industrial neighborhood where they've been converting industrial buildings for housing. And there's and there's really a mixed use nature and it's already sort of a little bit more built in urban, but there are two homeless shelters there and they're very, very protective of their homeless shelters. So this is a neighborhood where people understand that there are homeless people they don't want on the sidewalks, they wanna help them. And so the homeless shelters are there to help people get off the street and then to get into housing and they help people get into housing. And so it's kind of a localized community that is helping people and I think sometimes in LA, it's just such a big place that people tend to forget that. And we have blanket zoning around entire, entire, mm -hmm. you know, entire cities that don't sometimes really reflect the, the neighborhoods. And we have something like, I think, 62 distinct neighborhoods in LA, but within those neighborhoods, where are the smaller kind of neighborhoods of who's going to protect people? And I think people who are homeless or people who are unlimited incomes do not have a voice. And so when you go to public meetings or public hearings, you know, you're speaking for people who aren't there, who, have, who are working three jobs and taking care of three kids and there might be a single mom or a single dad. And so we all have to be the voice for these people. And I really feel strongly about that. And I, and I look to other places and um, 
someone yesterday mentioned Helsinki and Helsinki has what they, it's a 40, 40, 20 um, goal, which is 40% of their housing is market rate. 40% of their housing is subsidized. And then 20% is what they call the missing middle. And so we've talked a lot and I know we've worked a lot with people who are homeless and sort of the, the very poor or on limited incomes, but there's this whole middle that we're not talking about and they call it this missing middle. And so that's where maybe these land trusts come in where people can have equity and, um, you know, and, and there is a middle, I think the middle is disappearing. So I think, but everybody's housed. So, you know, the goal is there's no one on the street, people get housed and they have this model that seems to work. And so I think there's a lot of things that can be done, but, but I think looking at your own community and becoming an advocate and a voice for people who don't have one is really the start because we're all professionals and we kind of know what these issues are. And I go to public hearings for other uh, projects that are in my neighborhood done by other architects, because I think that that's really important for my neighborhood. And so I think if we all could do that, that that would just do a lot. Uh, so I, I want to, um, I see here from the chat um, question from Craig Shimahara, um, and I don't know, right, I, I think we, I'm reading some of the things that I see here on the chat, but if you feel like uh, asking live, but I want to connect one question from Craig and another one from Daniel Yu. So Craig is asking, is there a viable pathway towards the human right to housing? And then um, Daniel Yu, he says, why do we have, he's asking, right? Why do we have to associate housing with economic status? And I, I think I wanna add here part of a conversation that we had earlier this week that how can we make housing, right? A health uh, urgence or emergence, right? So think about, I think something that Ian mentioned, right? Think about housing prescribed by doctors, right? So I wonder when we think about uh, connecting Craig's and Daniel's questions, right? Uh, how can we talk about housing as human rights? What is that path, right? And could that be, as, as the point that we look at that as a health emergence, right? And associated that as, as a prescribed by doctor, right? Is that a way, how can we make that really happen, right? Well, I think for sure that's a that's a health problem because we know that if you are homeless, your life expectancy is 20 to 30 years lower than it would be if you were housed. So that's a fact, you know, I think the bigger question is, does anybody care, <laughs> you know, so it, there are other countries where there are no homeless people and they are not the wealthiest country in the world or the fifth wealthiest country in the world, you know, so it's a part of it is just caring. And, um, and after hearing everybody talk, I think a part of it is also like how we talk about these things. So when people talk about housing units, you know, or apartment buildings, you know, we really design build, we design a building if it's got 50 apartment units in it, it's 50 homes for people. So they're homes, they're houses. And when we talk about affordable housing, it comes with all these connotations, you know, and it's really just, it's housing, you know, who cares if you're a college student, you don't have any money and you don't have any parents and you need to live in, in a place, you know, we should stop calling it. I think we're getting stuck on a lot of the language and it's really just kind of what we as a society need to do, which is house everyone. Definitely. And it probably, and it is a 40 year plan, you know, like Dana said, but I think now's the time to really push it. Yeah, I think it's a really important point and insight to just identify, you know, access to shelter or housing as a basic human right. And for that to be kind of seen in that context. And it's, we're, we're doing a, a bit of research into social housing, which has obviously been a <laughs> many, many decade uh, long pursuit, but currently looking um, globally and, and specifically focused in, in Mexico City. And one of the things that is so, um, you know, kind of like you know, it re relates to the question is that, that it is a constitutional right within Mexico and whether that's upheld or not is something that's completely different. But, but that is a direct um, extension of a kind of more widely held set of values that that culture embraces and, under, you know, and, and, and represents and the way that that then manifests within policy. I think that that's a disconnect that we've completely lost. And I don't know if it just feels so kind of foreign or so separate from us. Um, being able to recognize it, that kind of direct representation of what it is that we kind of all hold dear and, and, and value as, as people is, is what should exist within our policy. 
Um, and, and I, you know, I think that it becomes challenging. It becomes complicated and convoluted when you're, when you're trying to kind of address these issues at that most formative um, level. Um, but I think that we as architects really need to be able to have an understanding beyond just where our immediate reach is to be able to have kind of the degree of influence that we have. And I think that it is kind of reaching back to some of these kind of deeper recesses um, in our culture in order to be able to, to have any um, kind of, you know, real lasting um, impact there. Well, I think if it's a, if it's a 40 year process, which it, you know, may even be longer. We, we need to think about what are the first steps that we can sort of take to start that process along. You know, I sort of go back to, you know, the whole issues of global warming and sustainability and climate change, you know, started in, in funny ways back in Earth Day in 1971, 1970. Um, and, was, you know, some college students in campuses across the country sort of starting that, that conversation. And then it sort of became, you know, the, the realization, the science sort of reinforced that realization became at, at the global scale. So what, what's the conversation that we can start? What's, what are the first steps that we as architects, as planners, uh, as students can do to, to start moving in that direction? I think the conversation that Luciana was um, alluding to, which is kind of twofold. One is, you know, real progress was able to be made in identifying or kind of, you know, drawing attention to the homeless crisis when it was seen as a, as a, as a health crisis, as, a, as a health issue. And that, you know, obviously opened up all sorts of, um, you know, different funding and different political will and different kind of attention at a whole different level. And I think that that was really important. One of the conversations that is taking place with this kind of broader social housing research that we're having in the practice is we're always looking for analogous lines of thinking to be able to kind of present some future for ourselves, you know, because usually as architects and urban designs, we're running a little bit behind what is <laughs> maybe the most progressive line of thinking. Um, and, and so one of the things that we've been using as a way to be able to kind of forge our own perspective is um, looking, at, at, looking at it as similar to um, the access to public health care and the way that that conversation has evolved um, within our society, you know, even in the last, you know, 10, 15 years with Obamacare and, and obviously it's still very much part of the political debate. Um, but, but you can see how access to shelter, access to housing, and again, especially positioned within the context of recognizing it as a basic human right, how um, access to housing can follow kind of a similar evolution and a similar time frame. So when we're talking about 40 years, I hope it's 20 or 10 or 10. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, the more that we um, have conversations like this, the more that we're able to focus on it. And, and again, the more we're able to kind of hold it in the degree of importance that it really deserves, allows us to facts uh, track those things. Um, but I can see hopefully in near future where we're able to, um, you know, recognize it as um, kind of in the degree of importance that it really kind of has and actually focus some resources towards it. I think the twin crises that we're in right now of COVID and um, the affordability or certainly homelessness is, um, is something that we should really pursue as a, a way of talking to people, a way of getting people's head around it. And I, I think you all have talked about housing as a human right and just keep uh, pushing that issue because um, money is the key to, to this problem. I and mean, money is always the key. And um, to get people to literally buy into that and understand of why you know this is your humanity that's on the line and you know people are getting sick and they're dying and they're you know on the streets and um, you can change that and you know with competing um, competition for resources right now is going to be really hard but sort of putting that idea of housing as human right as architects i think would be a very very powerful um, thing to do and showing examples of you know, the work that that all of us are doing and um, how, how great it is and it's affordable and the people that live there are not like wrecking your neighborhood. So I think um, we're in a, a good place to at least start the conversation. I heard a statistic on the, the news at some point today that 
it's something we all know but don't think about. We, we think about how the World Trade Center sort of brought everyone together and sort of everyone sort of had a common thought and a sort of common nationality and sort of a goal after, after that. And every day now, every two days, more Americans die from, from the pandemic, from COVID, than died in the World Trade Center. So I think the pandemic really may be the, uh, and Dana referred to it before, you know, maybe may the, the motivation that sort of gives us the opportunity to bring it together, that sort of gets the conversation started, started this conversation, this, this panel today. I think if that goes forward, that, that's from this conversation continues. Um, there may be some good light at the end of the tunnel. So um, I wonder, I, I want to check with uh, Chuck and Kirill how we are doing with time, because I, we might, I, I also want to make sure that the audience, I, I know with this conversation, we just can't keep going, right? So, but it's 7.30, so I want to see if the audience, if anybody wants to raise your hand or like speak up. Um, and uh, I want to check with Chuck and Kirill how we are doing with time, because we also want to give uh, a chance for the speakers to have closing comments, right? Yeah, I think we can have uh, maybe one more question from the audience. And then uh, after that, we can have closing thoughts by the panelists. Well, can I make a suggestion? Because at least for me, um, the response to what was just said uh, could certainly be my closing comments. And I think that we've all sort of, in the past few minutes, like summed up what we want to say. So that might give a little bit more time. So my So, um, any other questions from the audience or do we wanna wrap it, wrap it up? Anybody Rick out there? Rick is raising his hand. There is a raised hand. Go ahead, Rick. Hi there, I don't know if you can hear me. But uh, it's been a wonderful uh, conversation. And uh, I'd like to, first of all, um, provide a, a support to the AIA and to the, uh, those of us that are interested in architecture through the AIA for this dialogue, because it's, it's an incredibly important aspect of our society, but certainly our city. And for those of you that know me, I work mostly in the private sector. And the private sector is not to be ignored as a possibility for helping in this problem. Uh, I think you, it's one of the situations where I think you want to take it where you can get it. And when you have an opportunity to build a 40 or 50 story building for housing and an owner wants to commit 10% of that for uh, low cost housing, uh, what you have there is an opportunity to build on a transit corridor, which otherwise is almost unaffordable to build normal low cost housing. And so in a situation like that, you can build 39 units of low cost housing right on top of a, of a, a transit corridor on Wilshire Boulevard. What could be better than that? It's a wonderful opportunity to add to uh, the opportunities we have in, in providing low cost housing. And in particular, perhaps you find these developers that that are committed to doing uh, housing that is indistinguishable from one economic sector to the other. What could be wrong with that? And I think it's important that we open our dialogue to, to press on low cost housing issues that are uh, done by governmental authorities and deal with them as, as uh, Dana and Angela have been talking about, but also to open it up to private sector because there's a wonderful opportunity out there to think clearly about how that works. Now, it's important to realize that the number 20% uh, is hard on a 40 or 50 story building uh, to make sense economically, but 10% is definitely doable. And what could be wrong with that? Thank you. I think that goes back to you know, the, the government you know, Los Angeles has its, its transit-oriented corridor. You know, the TC entitlements and enhancements. Um, there, there are all sorts of legislation that's been trying to go through the the state assembly, 
in terms of allowing increased density along you know transit related corridors bus corridors you know fixed fixed guideway corridors um so those incentives are there but they're coming from the government you know that that 10 percent bonus for affordable housing in terms of density or, or number or far you know did, didn't come from the private investor that came from the government to sort of facilitate that move by the private investor. So I think the two have to work hand in hand. Actually, it's not quite accurate. Um, when you do the economics of a large development, yes, indeed, the, the incentive is there, uh, but the opportunity uh, works out in the economics of the, of the project, which is pretty exciting. And I just think that it's interesting that uh, we, we all need to get on band width of, of as wide as possible to solve this problem. Yeah, I think what Rick is saying is that, you know, we don't have inclusionary zoning, right? We don't require developers to build, um, if they're not in a TOC, to build a project with 10% affor uh, affordable units. We don't require that. We could, though. Well, there, there was, you know, talk in, in LA for a number of years. I think other cities do have it of, of inclusionary housing. That if you build market rate, if you build affordable market There's, rate housing, you, you have to you have to sort of incorporate right. some level of affordability or put the money into a trust fund that can be used offsite. Right. At one, yeah. at one point, one, one of the city council members, uh, half in jest but but half in seriousness, also proposed that any affordable housing project had to have an inclusionary market rate component, so it, it, you didn't create you know ghettos of affordable housing. By the way, well, I think I think the other aspect of this group is to be the voice that helps lead our, our uh, government people uh, in the yeah. election, recent elections and changes of things. It's important to make sure that the AIA and all of you and us that care about this, uh, our voices are heard by, by our political uh, leadership. It's very, very important. And there's something to be said for that, Barry. I think, you know, why do we, why do we have projects that are 100% affordable housing? It's only because those the nonprofits do it that way right. and if we had 50 50 or some other math you know i mean to me that's what makes uh, a great city you know to have a mixture you can't put people on limited incomes all of them in one neighborhood and i know in san francisco they do a, um, much denser projects than they do here and so i've never actually done a project that has more than say 100 permanent supportive housing units in it but in san francisco they don't do projects that have more than a certain number of permanent supportive housing units because these are people who have either disabilities or other issues that have to be taken care of and it just doesn't work in a building to have so many units of one of that type. So it makes sense to have some um, variable levels of income levels in every project that we do in the city. And maybe everything should be inclusionary and then we talk about the percentages, you know, and the density and those kind of vary. But um, the ironic thing to me is that we have built this transit system throughout our city and it went through industrial areas where there was no housing allowed to be built. And um, like Lincoln Heights, for instance, where the gold line is, you know, or the long or down to Long Beach. And so we worked through a nonprofit that I co-founded to actually change the zone to allow housing to be built along these transit corridors. But we've built a transit corridor and now we need to kind of come back and actually build these 20 minute neighborhoods around it. Right. So what we're doing is a lot harder than doing it the other way, but I feel like we have the infrastructure here. We just need to make it better. In, um, in West Hollywood, we had, we have, um, 20 uh, inclusionary housing for all projects, I think over two units and um, it's 20% half low and half mod and um, it's working and um, it's been working for, I don't know, however old the city is, so 25, 30 years old. And, um, but a real estate or housing developer, a friend of ours and um, some of you know him, uh, Doug Ring, and he, we had, you know, again, a meeting um, of AIA and we were talking about inclusionary housing and oddly enough, the architects were like, oh, this will never work. So thank you, Rick. Um, but, <laughs> the, um, but then Doug was speaking and he said, you know, they, in our community, we always say the sky is falling, the sky is falling. When they said we needed to sprinkle our building, the sky was falling. Every, you need to 
have handicap access, the sky is falling. And he said, as far as I know, the sky has never fallen. The market sort of straightens things out uh, that land prices then understand uh, the differences. And um, for some reason, LA just won't do it. Um, so, you know, having people like Rick, who's um, not known as a crazy liberal, although he is, um, but uh, can, can speak to people as, as well as all of us and talk to um, politicians and remind them, you know, the reason why you have people on the street is because they can't afford housing. And, you know, of course there's, you know, people who are, have illnesses and other things, but it's becoming now with, with COVID and people not being able to pay their rent and not working, that it's a problem, the housing affordability problem is just going into all sectors and having um, some kind of inclusionary housing uh, would just be such a boon to the city where you know there's this giant, there has been this giant um, housing boom in the recent past and we got nothing out of it. So you know, trying to um, move forward with um, something like that would be extremely helpful. Oh, I wanna, I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely, we all can see that this discussion just keeps going, right? And I, and I think it's great. And I think we definitely, I'm hoping that this um, conversation that we had tonight can keep going, right? We can have more of those. And I think like somebody um, posts on the chat that um, we can also find ways of opening this to a larger audience, right? With the city or other, uh, taking outside the, ex, right, the, the architects um, conversation. So, I want to double check, and again, right, I think you're all, I don't know if where you're at, if you want to do any closing remarks or if Kirill, Chuck, do you want to, Kirill, you want to say something? Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Luciana. And uh, and I'd like to, to just uh, take a moment to thank all the panelists on behalf of the Two Byte Committee. Um, and as we had the conversation today, um, I, th I think it's very worthwhile to, to think of the student projects that serve as the backdrop for this program and, and that make it possible. Um, a lot of the projects dealt with many of the issues that were discussed um, using the drivers such as light and air, um, old drivers that are perhaps new again um, for, for projects and for creating equitable housing. Um, also, of course, uh, the, the discussion around single family zoning um, and uh, different takes on that and, and how to construe it um, to, to create more density. Uh, and of course, uh, as we hope that this pandemic is the true crisis that uh, will serve as the impetus for, for housing black and brown lives, um, we, we do hope that that, um, that that will happen, of course, and that we can embark on this 40 year, 40 year process that uh, Danikoff um, basically um, related to the tenement reforms um, back at the turn of the century. Uh, also, uh, of course, all, all of the, these shared housing models, um, basically various housing typologies um, discussed by the student projects are, are very relevant, um, I think, in, in this professional discussion um, as well. So, uh, I th yeah, I th uh, I'd, I'd just like to thank, thank the panelists and thank the students um, who, who joined um, this call. And of course, I'd like to thank Chuck for organizing and, and for Luciana uh, for also moderating the discussion tonight. Uh, and uh, we'd, we'd like to close by uh, mentioning that we have one more free virtual event um, that is complementary to, to this one that we just had. Um, in a week from today, we will be hosting the Dismantling Systemic Racism and Pedagogy discussion uh, where we will uh, bring together uh, speakers representing nine local architecture schools um, and, and the schools as, as well as the students will participate in a discussion on how to advance the effort to dismantle systemic racism in academia, um, basically complementing our discussion for dismantling systemic racism in housing that we had today. So the event starts at 6 p.m. and uh, please join uh, via the link uh, in in the chat um, that, that we just sent. Um, yeah, and, and thank you so much to all the attendees and I hope you all have, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Okay.
Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. Great job, great job. I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you so much, Corinne.